Hello, good afternoon. I'm David from the Marché des Films. I'm very pleased to welcome you this afternoon for this roundtable about the international production with China. This is part of the first China summit organized by the Marché des Films in Cannes. And uh, we hope that uh, you will enjoy with this program and this uh, roundtable. I'm sure because it will be moderated by Clifford Coonan from The Hollywood Reporter, who is great to be our partner. <laughs> and so I will give him the microphone. And I particularly thank also Mr. Pohu from Deloitte for his help and the introduction he will proceed for you. And uh, I will give now, this is the business of Clifford. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, to begin with, um, we're going to have uh, some introductory remarks from, from Ho Po from, from Deloitte, uh, based in Shanghai. So um, maybe if we start off with that, and then, um, and then I'll introduce the panel after that. Thank you. This working? OK. Good. So uh, my name is uh, Po Ho. I am from uh, Deloitte, China, uh, from Shanghai. It's interesting to see so many people from Shanghai to be in Ghana. So uh, it's uh, you set the stage well for the uh, international production. So it's a truly international occasion. I don't know who set this picture, but I love it. <laughs> um, Okay, good days ahead. It's uh, I guess the uh, the whoever selected the picture choose who wanted to say that the uh, together we are more beautiful, and um, let's see whether it is true. So um, I'm not going to read all the small fonts, so don't worry about the text. If you want a copy of the uh, presentation, please contact uh, Clifford, and uh, maybe we can uh, we can we can have a dialogue and share. So the whole purpose of uh, the, uh, where the, first of all, where's the co-production concept coming from? It's from the regulation. It's, uh, it's uh, designed as a vehicle to, uh, to bypass the 64 uh, film uh, limitations. Um, it's supposedly a vehicle. And uh, to qualify for the uh, co-production, there are different, uh, every, every, almost every year there's an update on the, what qualified. For example, like uh, you need to hire the people from uh, China, you need to be, take the shootings from China, et cetera, et cetera. And the ratio is a little bit uh, arbitrary. Um, like uh, what do you mean 30% of the staff? It's measured by head or measured by people's salary. Nobody really knows. but. Uh, by and large, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, chances are that uh, it depends on uh, the partner you choose. And if you choose with the, uh, uh, the partner who, uh, who has a more uh, uh, better relationship with the regulators, which is soft, uh, you have better chance of uh, passing the qualification uh, procedure to, so that uh, your, 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 your film can, uh, uh, the route is more meaningful to you. And uh, with, uh, so uh, nowadays, the, uh, with the exception of a very few uh, nations, most uh, large uh, film production nations already have the co-production agreement with, uh, with China. Uh, it probably with the exception of Japan. I see Japan is missing, right? For the other uh, rest uh, large nations, they have the agreement uh, with the Chinese government. So uh, due to this shortage of, uh, uh, of supply, we see that the co-production films, uh, they are doing very well in China, although they accounted for a limited amount and number uh, in terms of counts of titles. They, if you look at the right-hand side, uh, the box office, they contribute a very significant part of, um, of the uh, China market. So that's, that's not a surprise. Co-production usually means say, a, a good uh, promise for higher quality than the average film being produced by the domestic market. And then, uh, so the definition of co-production includes Hong Kong, 
traditionally. Uh, so Hong Kong, China, mainland China, coal production used to be a, a phenomenon uh, until recently. Uh, the, the Hong Kong uh, is, uh, is uh, been uh, the, the, the influence being eclipsed by uh, uh, pure Western directly uh, co-production with uh, Chinese producers. And we see that the, uh, if you look at Hong Kong, it's still quite important, but the uh, US, France, and the South Korea, the combined uh, volume already exceeds 50%. Uh, and I'm not going to bother you with the history of the crude production. Um, long story short, coal production has been there for a while. And every year, the, um, almost every once in a while, there are new nations signing agreement with SOFT to, uh, uh, to use that vehicle to enter China. And this is the most uh, recent ex, uh, development in the, in the US and in uh, Korea. So I'm going to stop my uh, uh, presentation pretty quickly, but by showing the two uh, pictures here. The first is a, a pretty good performance uh, co-production result, uh, Wolf Toten. Um, this is an example, of, pretty typical example of using the uh, global resource. A, uh, from, from, in this case, from a uh, director from uh, France uh, to produce with Chinese counterparty uh, based on the bestseller. Uh, which is a Chinese originated content uh, using a combination of uh, uh, global uh, actors and uh, but the majority is Chinese actors tailored to the China market, uh, primarily to the China market. Of course, they ex try to export, uh, export it elsewhere as well. And we see that the uh, box office is pretty good, uh, 700 million uh, RMB in uh, 35 days. Pretty good result. but. Uh, this model, what I would call made in China for China together, uh, is still the old model. Primarily, it's co-production to please the Chinese market. Uh, this, however, personal belief is there's probably a limit to that. That's the limit. Then what is the um, outside of this uh, model's limit? I would say, how about this? Co-production in the future, made globally, for global, for the global. And I'm going to uh, explain why. To be blunt, anything that is designed just for China is very unlikely to go very far outside of China. OK? So if you invite a uh, French chef to do Chinese cuisine that may sell well in China, but there's absolutely no guarantee that can sell well in New York. And so the next chapter of co-production um, in, in its current sense, we need to probably bypass the mindset of uh, regard it as a vehicle to sell into China. So look at this, the box office to be in, in China alone in 15 days. So chances are, if something is good globally, and forget about China for a moment, if it's made in China or made not in China, it's going to be sell well as well. So Chinese investors, uh, they are probably better off treat co-production opportunities as a vehicle to serve the globe rather than just to look at the China, which is actually quite a narrow market. I'm going to stop here and uh, hand over to Clifford. Thanks very much for that. That's a very interesting take on co-productions, which is uh, quite a dizzying subject in many ways because it um, covers so many different areas, has different meanings to different people at different times, and um, but is also something that is incredibly appealing now both within China and from, with outside, from outside China. So when we were organizing this, um, this event, and I was trying to think of people who would take part, um, I thought what, what would be the most interesting and perhaps the most valuable for 
um, for people coming to, to see uh, the, the round table would be to get people with a very uh, varied take on, um, on, on co-productions and on the Chinese film market generally. Um, because co-production is, in international terms, it's, it's the face of the Chinese film market. And, um, but it all obviously covers that there's a lot of different areas, whether it be production, um, the legal area, whether it be um, you know, financing. There's, there's so many different areas to look at. So that's why I think we've got a really good panel today. Um, and um, so maybe if I start calling people up one by one. Um, so uh, Wendy is uh, Executive Vice President um, at Lionsgate. Um, and she's just been involved in one of the bigger deals in the in the Chinese film business with uh, with Hunan TV. Yeah. Uh, welcome her. Which was a ground groundbreaking groundbreaking event, and um, maybe we can ask her to to fill us in a little bit on that now, um, because the dust has settled a little bit, and and maybe we have a bit of perspective. Um, and then next, um, Nansen Shu, who's um, who's chairman of Distribution Workshop, among other titles, <laughs> and who has produced uh, many, many blockbusters. Um, most recently, um, was Flying Swords? No, uh, that was Taking that? Tiger, uh, Tiger Mountain, yeah, Taking of Tiger Mountain most recently. But there, there's a, a long, long list. And, um, so, and she has um, experience both working in Hong Kong and, um, and in mainland China. And um, she has uh, a lot of insights into uh, into working in these two fascinating markets. And then next is uh, if uh, Alan Wang Jun, uh, who's uh, a senior partner at the Yinke Law Firm in China. Um, as you know, that a lot of these changes that have happened in China. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that's happened in China in recent years, I mean, a lot of this stuff is new, and um, a lot of entertainment law is new. There were, there were no precedents before, and people had to come up with these. Uh, they've had to write the rule book in some ways going along, and um, Alan is one of the people who's been involved in writing that particular rule book, so maybe he can tell us, uh, give us some insights there. And then uh, Zhou Yuan, who's um, Executive Vice President of Linmon Pictures, Who um, who told me at lunch that he lived in um, Toulouse for for many years as uh, he speaks wonderful French. Although I think today he probably present in English. Um, uh, he's also he has a lot of experience in the industry, um, having been head of motion pictures at Shanghai Media Group for a while and and really developed that. And now is working with Linmon, which is um, invested by uh, Tencent, which is one of the one of these booming internet companies in China. So again, that's another aspect of, of, of the film industry. So um, what we thought as well would be interesting, uh, or what I'd like to hear anyway, um, um, maybe I'll just say a little bit about myself. Um, I've been in China for around 11 years, um, working with various publications and currently for The Hollywood Reporter, and um, covering the entertainment industry. And um, today I was writing my box office story, um, our weekly box office story. and. It occurred to me that um, that uh, Furious Seven made more than the entire Chinese box office in 2007. So, this is a sign of just how dramatic the rise in the Chinese film market has been. And um, in just two films in the last month, have made 540 uh, million dollars in in China, which is an astonishing figure when you consider when I moved to China in 2003. Hong Kong box office was bigger than mainland China. So these are dizzying figures. And um, driving that, as we, as we were seeing from the presentation, um, ha have been co-productions you know, in some sense, but mostly a lot of um, uh, you know, Hollywood and domestic productions. But co-productions are definitely seen as the way forward. So um, uh, when, we were, when I was thinking about what, what might be an interesting way to kind of bring this idea to life, I thought um, maybe to get as much anecdotal evidence um, from people as possible, because I think it's kind of interesting to hear what people's experiences are like on the ground trying to deal with co-productions. And, um, and also then to try and get a sense of what, what, a, what, what is a co-production. So basically to start off, um, I'm going to take my seat now, but I'm going to start off and, and ask people 
to just um, to give their definition of what a co-production means to them. So, Wendy, do you want to start? Oh, great. Uh, this is on, okay. So, Lionsgate does a lot of co-productions around the world, and it usually means teaming up with a partner in another country and making a movie. Uh, in China, it's slightly different because obviously to have a co-production, you have to have certain Chinese cultural elements and there are certain rules. But there are rules in every country, like in Canada, if you want to do a co-production, you have to have certain percentage of the crew or the writer or the director, Canadian, and you know, there's every country has its own rules. But basically, a co-production is finding a partner in another country and making a movie together. That's it. Okay, I started making my first co-production film in China in 1991. Uh, the rules at the time are still very similar to what they are now, which was what Mr. Ho mentioned just now. Basically, that China should have a some investment in it, Chinese partner. And for the on-screen talent, you have to be one-third Chinese, and that the story has to have relevance to China in some way. You can shoot the film entirely in New York, provided you're talking about Chinese immigrants in New York, for instance. But in 1991, uh, China was economically not what it is today. And I remember very clearly, when you have an agreement, you sign theoretically the Chinese party has to invest, but they had no money at the time. But then, of course, our laws, if we would put it that way, are very flexible. It says there's a clause which says, and other matters can be discussed in a supplementary agreement. The supplementary agreement you do not have to present. So that would give the kind of exit, the door for you to have a separate agreement which says you know, the Chinese party is not paying a penny, uh, but then you, we own the IP, we own the rights. But of course, fast forward very quickly nowadays, I'm not sure whether you all know, but many films in China, the big budget films, let's say at least 20 a year, are made at US dollars, 20, 20 million, 25 million, 30 million dollars, and they're made 100% equity, 100%. Nobody's heard, heard of gap financing, uh, whatever, <laughs> financing, completion board, never heard of it. I think one of the reasons everybody's trying to do co-production in China is very practical. For the longest time, until two years ago, if you are an imported films, uh, co-production films are considered as the same status when you distribute the film in China as a local film. Then there's a, for imported films, there's a quota. And there are 20, well, I don't want to go into the different stages what happened, but now at this mo moment is 20 films is the quota where you can import a film on a revenue sharing basis. Then there's an additional 14, which is either going to be digital or 3D. Then you can have revenue sharing. Otherwise, it's a flat deal. Until up to two years ago, imported films revenue sharing, as we call it now in the film industry, the film rentals, which is the part the distributor gets, the cinema gets almost half and more. The part which the other, the owners and the film producers and the distributor gets is called film rentals, used to be for imported films 13%. Whereas for local films and co-production films, it's between 39 to 42%. So obviously, you want to do a co-production film because your share of the market is much higher. Two years ago, President Xi went to the States and they gave a, brought him a, a present to the American films or other, other imported films. And now that percentage from 13, and I, I don't want to mislead you, it's 13, but if you reach certain box office, it goes up, okay? So basically, simply put, it's 13. It's now gone up to 25%, so it's much better. But still, co-production films, you can get 42% uh, of the box office. So that is a very practical reason why everybody wants to do co-production films. For me, as Mr. Howe pointed out uh, earlier on, because Hong Kong filmmakers have been uh, interacting with the world uh, filmmaking community for over 30 years, when China opened up early in the early 2000s, really basically from 2003, when Clifford mentioned the box office was actually about the same as Hong Kong, 800 million RMB. The most number of films in the early days were um, mostly Hong Kong uh, co-productions, because obviously, uh, yes, one country, two systems. So Hong Kong is considered two system in co-production. So because of Hong Kong filmmakers have a lot of experience, so we work a lot in China. 
uh, with ba basically making Chinese language films, whereby we brought in some certain expert uh, skill sets which we have gathered over the years, not only from storytelling, uh, from the, the 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 skills of actually making a film, the technical skills, but also marketing skills. Uh, branding skills, uh, uh, knowledge about film festivals and how to market our films internationally. I think we brought a lot of that. But of course, as the market has opened up nowadays, many, many countries want to do co-production. I think a lot of the American co-productions in China now are still really not true co-productions in that you contribute very uh, equally in terms of the content. Um, it's still really with an eye to the market that you add some Chinese elements to make it qualify. Um, but I'm sure that would change because everybody's looking for stories which would be more reflective of a true co-production spirit. Uh, so I think that would, you know, inevitably change. But uh, I think when Mr. Howe said just now, uh, you know, we should not be just looking at co-production for a China market. I think any person who produces a movie in the world wants as many people to see it, see that film, as many people as possible to see that film. But because the China's market has grown so absurdly quickly that I think people are so, still so focused on the China market now. But every film I think released in China, they want to have an international market. It's just that it's not quite yet ready. Um, I have lots of funny stories to tell and strange stories and horror stories to tell about my co-production experience, but I'll leave it for later. <laughs> okay. Uh, Madam Sh just gave a, a very clear explanation on co-productions with China and even did a better job than me in the legal <laughs> compliance <laughs> information on that. So as far as I can say, I'd like to, to add some comments from the commercial aspects. You know, uh, annually, the, the, the quota for revenue, sh uh, revenue sharing uh, films to be distributed in China, the total figure is 34. And among the 34, at least 14, should be from United States with 3D or IMAX format. And among the rest, uh, 20, at least six non-American film for revenue sharing to be distributed in China. So regarding the, the European market, if, if we consider the, the figure for a revenue sharing film, there's only, maybe there's only six left for, for, for the, those those kind of um, uh, revenue sharing um, films, so we have to choose to do an international co-production with China project by project, which means such kind of international co-production projects will be regarded as domestic uh, film by Chinese uh, uh, film authorities, which cannot uh, which will not cover any quota, and can be. Uh, a uh, distributed in China uh, by Chinese uh, distributors instead of uh, those uh, China Film Group or Huaxia uh, Film Distribution Group. So this is quite a, a difference, and it's, uh, it's almost the only way to, to enter Chinese, ma Chinese market. Yeah. Okay, my understanding of the I mean co-production is. Um, Probably in different layer. The first one is probably from legal and uh, legal and their uh, administration standpoint of view. There's a, a qualification issue for one third of the employee, one third of talent, or one third of the investment requirement from the Chinese authority. It probably comes also from the difference between the revenue sharing model between the crew production and their purely, I mean, foreign imported movie. But I want to add another different layer of our understanding of uh, co-production, which is border uh, as a legally called co-production. I think um, for anybody who want to make a uh, producer who want to make a global movie or um, a movie for an uh, international market need to think China as a very key and unique market into your uh, packaging or development processes. Not really for um, qualify your production as crew production, but I think there's a lot of involvement into uh, from China um, as long as money, market, or talent. For example, I mean, uh, when they used to, uh, we worked together in 2013, 
uh, when I was in SMG, we have acquired one title from Lionsgate, uh, which is a purely American production, but the box office performance that we got from China market has been doubled in North American figures. So it's a purely American story, purely American uh, investment and uh, production, but got uh, at least half of their pro box office from China. So I think for this kind of project, we can definitely um, involve China's uh, company and China's money and China's investor in the earlier stage uh, without thinking even it will be qualified as a co-production or not. So uh, in this is pretty much my understanding of the, um, of the crew production. I think one of the things that's been discussed um, a lot recently, um, is that there is this notion of a co-production that is going to make money in every market in the world, a Chinese um, foreign co-production. Um, at the moment in, in, um, in Beijing and in Qingdao and various sites around China, they're shooting the Great Wall, um, this legendary East co-production, which has got a major China film group component, um, which is a, a kind of a Pacific Rim style, um, trans well, not Transformers, but monster movie um, set around the creation of the Great Wall. And a lot of people are talking about this in China at the moment because it's almost like a textbook case of how you, you know, it's almost like it's, it's taken the law on what qualifies as a co-production and is examining it, you know, that you have a uh, Chinese director in Zhang Yimo, you've got um, several significant foreign and Chinese stars, but it basically ticks a lot of the boxes. And I think a lot of people are watching this in China at the moment to wait to see what happens because if it succeeds, it it could be a game changer um, where, you know, initially, of course, there will be a lot of very similar projects, but, but still the, the principle that you can do it will have been established. But then also it may fail, and like any other movie, it may not work, you know. Um, do, do the panel think that, um, that this kind of model, um, you know, is this something that, that you guys are also sort of watching to see what happens? Yeah, I, I can say I think everyone's looking at the Great Wall because we all want to see, we're all looking for that magical film that will work both in China and the rest of the world um, and, and do box office. There's been a lot of films that have, like um, Karate Kid, which worked outside of China but didn't work as well in China. Um, and we're all... I know Lionsgate, we're looking for the worldwide audience. We're not looking to make a movie just for China or, or just for the rest of the world. We are looking for that worldwide wide box office. And we don't want to try to, if, if it doesn't quite qualify as a co-production, then we're going to make it not as a co-production. For instance, on Now You See Me Too, we're shooting in Macau, and we're, we hired Jay Cho as, as one of the new stars, who isn't Chinese, he's Taiwanese, but he appeals to the Chinese audience. So we are, we're looking to China, but we're looking to make a commercial movie that will work throughout the world, and that we're not having to fit within a certain little little box. But of course, if we can find a, a movie that that, you know, can fit all the qualifications to meet a Chinese co-production. We definitely want to do that. Almost every um, studio, independent producer, whatever in between, I've spoken to in the last two years have been looking for that movie, which will appeal to the to the world market. Uh, but of, but of course, they're much more conscious about the China market now since it's grown to such incredible, you know, figures. Um, like I said earlier, as a producer, I, everybody wants to make a movie where the most number of people watch it as possible, right? Not just even com commercial con considerations, your personal ego demands such, you know, ambitions, you know? So, but of course, of course, now really in the last few years, um, it's a very serious consideration. And I know all these, all the studios, that they, a lot of whom have had people in China for a number of years now. Uh, all trying to to do that, you know. But some are doing, you know, indigenous productions, you know, for the local market. But men, I, almost all of them, I think, have are also trying to develop uh, these projects, which would have a worldwide appeal. Um, actually, my understanding is that for all the foreign 
a studio and a production company who want to make co-production with China, uh, the main um, uh, intention is to be leveraging in three different, three key elements from China: China's investment money, China's talent, and the Chinese market. So, uh, the Great War is probably a wonderful example for Legendary East to uh, has accomplished all the three um, key elements in this one single project. But the things that I want to um, um, make a word here is that. Money is probably the easiest one to find in China, and the market is here also to, to, to be leveraged on. But the talent is really something very hard to, to be packaged into project like Great Wall. I mean, the, the talent like the Zhang Yimou directors or Jackie, as a, Jackie Chan as actor is very much unique that can link, uh, link the Chinese market, domestic market with the international market. I think there is a very, very, very few. I mean, opportunity for for a project can be packaged this kind of talent. So this is a wonderful example, but it is this is not going to be example that all the studio can copy on it. But I would just like to add that also, on the other hand, all the Chinese major film companies all want to also go out and do co-productions with Hollywood or. Um, mainly, I think, still Hollywood because it's still this uh, this uh, kind of feeling that you know to be associated with Hollywood is being the label of success. <laughs> so, um, so actually, I think a lot of the major film companies have been announcing uh, deals with uh, various uh, uh, overseas, uh, mainly American companies or individuals about doing uh, films where the two markets would cross. I think at this stage, in the last two, three years, it's the first stage of this kind of international major scale co-production, uh, which is not just Hong Kong, I mean, it's just really major international type. But this is the, the stage I would call the getting on the blind dates and then jumping into bed very quickly together. Then we see the next stage, which is the really kind of trying to live together as a couple, you know, then we'll see, you know, the daily lives, you know, and the trials and tribulations that will bring, you know. Okay, uh, Lutwi is one of my clients and I'm not allowed to, to give any comments on Great Wall <laughs> due to the <laughs> confidentiality agreement. But I'd love to say that, you know, the, uh, the practice between Hollywood, Europe, and China is, uh, it's really a big gap. You know, for Hollywood practice or European practice, you used to use like uh, 80 or 50 pages for a co-financing or co-production agreement. But, f but for Chinese, it's usually just like eight pages or less than 10 pages. You know, it says can, cannot, cannot cover every details in such a simple uh, agreement. And uh, you know uh, the the foreign the foreign parties are used to, to to have the lawyer to do the first job of uh, drafting the contract, and then the Chinese party always used to have the lawyer to do the final review of the contract before the sign. So it's quite different, and uh, but the situation is is uh, gonna change a little bit. And regarding um, those possible uh, co-production projects, I think the first thing to think about is a script. You know, in China, the, the Chinese government will, will review the whole script before they can give a, a, a shooting permit in China, which is a prerequisite to, do shoot, to, to shoot the film globally. And uh, you have to, to uh, forward your, your, your home um, uh, film to, to, to do a content review uh, by the uh, Chinese Film Bureau uh, before you get a release permit. And without the re release permit uh, by Chinese government uh, for a corruption film, the film cannot be released globally. So this is a um, basic principle for, for the management of corruption with China. It's um, interesting talking about script and the fact that um, that money is so readily available. I think a lot of filmmakers in Europe um, and in the US, it's, it's kind of the other way around, that the, the scripts, but it's hard to find money, whereas in China that is very much the case. That um, um, And um, 
we, well, another thing that was um, stru struck me is that um, the French have been very good at doing co-productions as well. For some reason, they seem to have. Uh, we've, I've discussed this with Isabel, who's sitting here before. Yeah, for <laughs> well, not for some reason, for many very good reasons, but, but I should say. A lot of it's Isabel's work, you see. I mean, yeah. that's why she's that's been very because of Isabel. I, it's yeah. actually, I, I mentioned another occasion like this. The most, uh, I think, the, other than the Americans, I think the uh, the rest of the world. Um, the French are the most successful in uh, establishing very close relationship with the China film industry now. But you were saying just now about, uh, 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 Mr. Do was saying about talent. This is the biggest problem. Uh, Ten years ago, there were about 100 films made a year. In the last two years, it's about 600-something to 800 films. I think that the year before that was 800-something like films. Of course, a lot of them were not released. And we all know talent does not happen overnight. There's money cannot change that. It just takes time to develop talent. And that talent on screen and off screen talent is just totally so lacking in, in China now. I mean, before when we started, and I hate to so say in our days what happened, a third AD would work for three years, you know, from third AD to move to third, second AD. And now I interview people in China and they come in, you know, very, very confident and say, I'm the best AD in China. Why is that? I've worked on nine films. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know. So, you know, that's the kind of you know. And but then everybody's doing it, so everybody's just kind of used to it now. It's just not enough time. You just need time to develop them. I mean, oh, sorry. Of um, course, there's a shot of talent in every, I mean, single I mean um, job application in China right now for this industry. And that's also the wise reason that uh, um, I spend a lot of time in the market like Khan because I think. This also provide opportunity for the European or American international talent to work with the China industry. We just need a new project and bridge that such um, between the China market with the international talent in this uh, professionals. Yeah, I was telling Clifford um, before we started that everyone I seem to work with in China is so young. It, it's not that I'm that old. It's just that they really are very young, <laughs> and um, and uh, I'm my experience. I, I feel like I'm I'm here on false pretenses because we actually haven't done a co-production yet. Well, we did one long ago, uh, Forbidden Kingdom, but we haven't done one in a while. Our, my experience is in distribution in China, and every I mean we're distributing The Hunger Games, for instance, and. Uh, I remember talking to the team who was distributing it, and they didn't know what a DCP was, you know, how or how to release it. And so I'm doing film 101 with our most important film, and it was very in the big in the second biggest territory in the world, and it was a little terrifying. But um, and uh, we we d we brought Louis Leterrier, the director of Now You See Me, to the Shanghai Film Festival, and he turned to me at one point and he said, "All the reporters are so young." You know, there every every it's a just a, it's a growing business in every way, and and physically the people are young. Do you think that um, in some ways that the the Chinese market is too the, there's too much of a focus on the money, and that there's kind of a disconnect now? We have all these screens. Um, I mean, looking at the the recent box office successes, we were talking about Breakup Buddies, um, Ning, Ning Hao's film, which. Is a, which is a very good film, um, but it's it's a film that wouldn't really, be, it's kind of a mid-market film in any other market, but in China it did an enormous box office um, because there seems to be an insatiable demand for content. Um, do you think that there's, but that there's, um, more, there still aren't the projects coming through fast enough? Well, there are never enough good projects. There are hundreds of projects every year and hundreds of films made, not enough good projects. Um, I guess it's, uh, you know, at, at the first, in the beginning, you know, I, I have to, historically, you know, our economic reform started in the late 1970s. And in the film business, in the film industry, the our reforms only started in 2001 and 2002, which is 25 years later than the economic reforms. So, so it's quite late, actually. I mean, so really the effects were felt from the year 2003 when from 2003 onwards, every year there's been double digit growth in box office. Similarly, in the number of screens in 2003, there were about 1,000, not 2,000, just under 2,000 effective screens. And now they're like 25,000. Like I said just now, films became 100, made, films made became from 100 to about, seven, let's say average 700. So this has happened very rapidly. And to 
show how interesting the market is. For the first 10 years, 03 to end of 2012, uh, if you look at the top 10 Chinese films in the year, almost, most, uh, at least half of them were made by Hong Kong film directors for the reasons I said previously, that they were more commercial filmmaking. And then the, the stars were always very big and more stars and more stars until sort of at the end of 10 years, it was one stage. At the end of 2012, from then on to now, two years, no, not, well, yes, um, yeah, two years. In those two years, there were seven films, very low budget, big box office, and they were all directed by people who were not trained as a film director. The first which started was Lost in Thailand, Tai Jong, he's an actor. Then there, was, uh, there were two writers. One is uh, Han Han, who did, directed The Continent. It's very low budget, I can't remember what it did. I mean, all these films are like 500 million, 600 million. All this r and yeah? so it's about six to one to US dollars. So 100 million US dollars, it's a lot of money for a very small film. Another director is Guo Jingming, he's also a writer. Totally not trained, you know. And then, and then the funniest one at the end that I always mention is a film called Baba Chunar. Where are you going, Papa? It's actually a reality show. It was shot in five days by two TV directors, multiple cameras. And then people were asking me, oh, this, this is not a film. It doesn't qualify. It's not a film. And I said, well, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not defending it, but it's in a format. It's in a DCP, which is releasable in a cinema. And then a distributor picked it up. And actually, the audience went and bought tickets to like <laughs> 700 million RMB. So how can I say it's not a film? Of course, it's not a film to me. But this is the way the market is. Have you ever be seen anywhere in the world where a reality show, where five daddies with the five little bo boys and girls just go, oh, daddy, daddy, can I fish in this pond now? And then there's 700 million. I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> this is the China market for you. So anything goes now, anything. Yeah, I think the reason can explain such uh, such phenomenon in China is because the other Chinese audience or so moviegoers are quite young and quite uh, different compared with the rest of the world. Um, the average age are extremely young compared with the global average of the of the audience. Another reason is that they are um, they are living in a in a in a world which is quite different compared with. Uh, uh, compared with the rest of the world, they are not using Facebook or or other other stuff, uh, global social media. So they are they are growing in a um, in a um, quite unique environment. So the, their taste and their um, their local taste is quite uh, important for for the local f uh, local movie maker to to make such projects. Half of their needs already being fulfilled by those Hollywood blockbusters plus the, the movie from the Lionsgate or from Kenneth Studio Canal. But uh, they, they still have a strong uh, local and uh, um, culturally ident identity that need be uh, expressed by these um, very local and unique movies. Yeah, I think that's what makes uh, China exciting right now. There is this insatiable appetite for content, and you don't know, like, what, what, what's gonna work next, a reality show? That, that's crazy, who would have thought? But um, that, that makes it exciting because you can really kind of experiment and try all different kinds of things. I mean, I think a lot, there are, are, I understand, quite a few f uh, films in development right now that are kind of science fiction-y type films because gravity worked really well and who knows, that may be the next thing. Yeah, and Interstellar worked really well. And I think the local filmmakers are thinking, okay, we're, we're gonna try to try that now. So um, it's, there's, the market is growing and changing and there isn't, for instance, um, an art house market yet. But I, I think that's something that will eventually grow and happen because there's a lot of people that are interested in those kind of films. So anything's possible. For example, for uh, 13 and 14 growth every year from China movie market, all this growth comes from the audience that has come first uh, their first time to to the theater in their life. So they are young and they are they don't know they don't have any uh, previous experience of the uh, of uh, 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 seeing a movie in a theater. So. Um, previously, their entertainment experience is much more from the television, from from the gaming, internet gaming. But now there's new 
uh, movie, new theater has been built up in the tier three and tier four city, which uh, gives an opportunity to, to enter into the market as a new audience. So for all the uh, Chinese movie makers, it's a wonderful opportunity to, to better leverage on their, their uh, content needs to create something really new, even something crazy. I mean, talking about the art house market is interesting because I think a lot of the co-productions, say, with European production companies have been for art house films. Um, um, uh, Wang Shaoshui's film, uh, Red Amnesia, which was released and was very popular at festivals, it got a screening in China, but they tended to be at 6 a.m. or midnight, um, so not many people got to see them until I think Wanda stepped in and actually gave him special screenings and and the movie did some box office. But um, what do you think is going to happen going forward with things like the non-blockbusters? I mean, um, uh, not Fear 7, Avengers, Ul Age of Ultron had 96% of all screens. 60 to 70% of the screens, but it totalized yeah. 19 and 95% of the bo daily oh. box office. Oh, the box office, okay. The right, so problem is very unhealthy now, because mm -hmm. any blockbuster like Fast and Furious and uh, and like the Avengers Ultron, it all, the bookings are all 60-something, uh, especially in the first few days, sometimes almost 70%, which means that uh, de facto, uh, you know, I mean, on figures it says 60 something percent, but de facto they're going to grab up most of the box office because the other percentage is taken up by either very small cinemas, remote cinemas, or very the bookings which are early or 10, 30 at night, you know, which is not meaningful screenings. So, of course, we all look to and we hope to, I mean, for a very developed uh, film, for a developed film market, the culture of film is also important. Uh, that there are commercial films, but that, that, that it raises the citizens, the people's, you know, level of appreciation, of cultural ap appreciation, and there should be. But then we're still waiting, because at the moment still, uh, although the build-out of uh, cinema screens is very fast, uh, still there's kind of, like, not enough. So when the commercial film comes, co film comes along, especially these U.S. blockbuster films, tentpole films, then the booking becomes ridiculous. The Fast and Furious first day did four hundred million dollars in the first day. I mean, that's really <laughs> four hundred million. Is, I don't know how much U.S. Uh, thirty, thirty something U.S. Which I don't know. You were referring is total box office China, you know, in whatever year, you know. But what can be done? Do you think to to make it um, uh, to force theater owners? Well, not to force, but to require theater owners to. Um, to show a more diverse slate? I, I think there it's as nonsense as you're gonna have to just, they've gotta build more theaters. Cause right now the, the, the exhibitors just wanna make as much money as possible. It's all about the, the RMB. So uh, they're gonna show the most commercial movies, whether it's the Chinese movies during the Chinese New Year or the big blockbusters, you know, they'll, they'll show the most commercial movies. Um, but you need, you, we need, there, there need to be, and they are building them. Once they get enough theaters, then they'll be able to have specialty theaters that focus on, on the more art house movies. You mentioned Wang Xiaoshui's movie at the same, on the same day, Sylvia Chang was a wonderful filmmaker, also had her first her film release, a new film called Murmurs of the Heart, and also did no business, because their booking was something like 3%, 4%. I mean, it's really very sad. Uh, but this, I don't think, you know, like Wendy says, you know, it's the exhibitors just want to maximize their profit now. And when, when, the, when the day comes, there's so many cinemas that people will start thinking about alternative programming, then that will happen. I don't tr believe in, the only thing you say, how can you force the exhibitors is, unless it's by some government act, but we don't want that either, right? Maybe just to talk a little bit about regulation and the regulatory background. Um, it's, it's something that I, I know a lot of people in Europe and, uh, and in the West are curious about when it comes to dealing with co-productions. I mean, we've, we've spoken a little bit about the legal background, but on things like getting script approval and censorship, um, um, are there any signs that, um, obviously like films like Furious 7 and Avengers don't, don't go anywhere near politics, you know, but um, are there any signs that the environment is getting easier or is, is it basically just, has it been the same now for the last, three years, given as that seems to be the period of massive growth? 
Um, I think in the since 1991, when I started doing my first co-production film, it, uh, it ebbs and flows depending on uh, it, it, it opens up a bit, and then then somebody does something naughty, then it tightens up again, and then the, all the good you know the law-abiding citizens like myself would go and say, "Oh, why are you penalizing us? You know, you should punish the bad guy, not us." And then it opens up a bit, and then somebody does something naughty, it closes up a bit, you know, it just goes on like after lust caution. Um, because, you know, the censorship in China now is there's only one category. I mean, everywhere in most developed film cultures, there are different categories. But in China at the moment, it's still one category. So basically, when you make a film, it's supposed to be one version for the developed coastal cities and the very rural, you know, uh, uh, agricultural back, backward part of China. And one version everywhere in the world. So Last Caution had a different version in Hong Kong. But of course, the difference was six minutes of a very um, explicit sex scene. So of course, the government noticed. So it was very, it was really clamped down. And then we all went to say, oh, you know, we complained, we did this, and then it loosened up again. Every time there's a new government, the the officials tend to be uh, understandably a little bit more conservative, just to not quite sure where the wind is blowing. I don't think I'm letting out any national secrets, but you know how it is. <laughs> it's the same with every government. Um, generally, I think it's not loosened up uh, considerably in a while, from, in my experience. Um, uh, uh, Alan was mentioning just now, you want to shoot in China co-production, you first send your script to be approved. They will send it back with notes, sometimes no notes, sometimes with notes, uh, then you're supposed to adjust them. Uh, sometimes, you, in our experience, sometimes you... You, you see a comment, you say, it may change later. So you shoot two versions just in case. Once you finish shooting, you submit the finished product, almost finished, because if we, we always we used to say, if we make us completely fully mix the whole thing and grade it, and you change, it's very costly to us. So now they allow you to do a kind of rough mix, and so it's like minus one version before you, 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 you spend a lot of your, the final cost. So you submit that for content, and they allow like 5% discrepancy in the visual effects if it's not ready. Then they will give you notes again. Now, some notes given the first time, may you may pass it the second time. Not serious issue things, but sort of gray area. They, you know, after you shoot it, it may look slightly different, interpreted differently. Then if the content goes through, then finally you have a technical uh, uh, censorship, which is usually theoretical. I have a story to tell about that. <laughs> anyway, so that's those are the steps you have to go through. Um, so that then you get the permit to to sh to release the film. First, you have to get the permit to show uh, to shoot the film. They get the permit to release the film. But my story about the technical thing is that one time my film made a, f a friend. Uh, my friend made a film about rock and roll thing, thing whatever people, rock and roll stars, or uh, up and coming rock and roll people. So at the f end credit, this is rock music going, and she scratches the negative to give a very raw effect. Of course, it went to technical censorship, and they said, this does not pass, because the, the, the negative is scratched. <laughs> yeah, Madam just mentioned that uh, you know, regarding the con content review, uh, according to the administrative uh, rules and regulations of film management, there are 11 um, aspects to be censored, and among them, ten related to content uh, for uh, the uh, political stance and the moral, and uh, their uh, you know their intention to 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 protect the good and to def to to you know to defend the evils. You know, it's always you know has some kind of um, flexible. Uh, judgment from the government. It's uh, it's hard to say uh, how how dense the, the scope is, and there's only one uh, aspect that's related to uh, the technical quality of that. Um, and regarding to uh, co-production, we have to uh, have clear idea about the the, the basic rules of uh, the requirement from Chinese government. And uh, just uh, Madam Shdes mentioned, and uh, at least one third of the budget should should be invested from the Chinese party, and uh, at least um, 
one third of uh, the leading cast should be Chinese uh, actors or actresses. And the film must be partially uh, finished or, or shoot in China. So it means you we have to do uh, the Chinese location, you have have the, uh, enough Chinese elements involved in the film uh, to, to make it uh, meet the, uh, the requirement of uh, co-production. Uh, one thing I'll say about all of the requirements and um, things you have to, the, the steps you have to do to qualify, when we're looking at co-production projects, we're really looking at is this a movie that we want to make? Is this a movie we want to green light and send out into the world, into the United States, which is our major market, because we're a distributor in the United States and, and the rest of the world? And is, if it doesn't qualify, is it still a movie we want to make? And, and the answer really has to be yes, because uh, otherwise, why make it, if it in, and try to make it just because it fits as a, as a co-production. So for instance, um, either Expendables 2 or 3, I can't remember which one. New, New Image was really the producer on that, but we were their partner. It was originally um, planned to be a co-production, and it started to go through the steps. And they, at a certain point, they realized, oh, it's not going to qualify. But we're still going to make it. We're still going to have a Chinese actress in it, but we're going to shoot it in Malaysia or wherever um, and, and just not qualify as a co-production, but we're still going to make that movie. And that's, that's the thing. You're, this is still a business. It's still hopefully an art. And, and, and we're, we're looking at both the commercial and the creative viability and not just whether it, it fits and ticks all the boxes. Uh, for if you are, want to co-produce in China, a lot of people who have no experience always say, "Oh, so the censorship. How do we deal with that?" There's no rule book. I mean, the the you know basic rules. There's no rule book, but you just use a lot of your common sense. Uh, there's definitely no no's. There's certain areas absolutely no. Uh, religion, uh, it's very against superstition. So no ghosts. You can say elephants and ghouls, but no ghosts. Um, you're not nothing to do with minorities because we have uh, we want to keep the racial uh, harmony. So uh, that's a no-no. Um, no corrupt cops. Uh, there are no corrupt cops in China. Uh, uh, yes, there are no corrupt cops in China. <laughs> is it, is it is it true? There's no time travel. Also, uh, yes. no, there is time travel. There is time travel. Yeah, we just did a time no time travel. travel for TV actually. TV because there was too much for a while. So for yeah, it was always there was time traveling for quite a bit, and then they banned it for a while. The film is can be time travel because it's not yet a lot of time travel. Is, where Shan's new film is a time travel piece. Right? Sorry. The Ghouls, which was launched here at Cannes. Yeah, but also we're doing a film called The Treasure, which is also time travel. Yeah. But he's right. The TV it was banned. And then, for instance, you see, now these are very clear ones, you know, like religion and um, minorities and um, Falun Gong, obviously. Um, but there are some not so obvious, which, you know, if you find a good partner, the most important thing, I think, in co-production is to find a good partner. And there may be companies with a lot of money or whatever, but it doesn't mean it's a better company for you. You have to, because of your project, you have to find a company which has the DNA, which matches yours, and that you find rapport. They all have money now, basically. So it's not the money. Money is the least of the issues. Um, so, so you know, you need your partners to advise you because if your partners are, are are really good producers and have a good reputation, they will they will get certain things which may not pass. Somebody else may not get passed. You know, slight things, not huge issues like ten corrupt cops. You will never get that passed. Okay. So, for instance, somebody sent me a script which I quite liked. It's about high school too. It's about these nerds who's a well, they're mathematical genius. And they go. They uh, selected to win the to go and compete in the. I can't remember the name of the mathematical Olympics, so to speak. So this English boy gets sent to China to do this group training, and then of course he stays with a Chinese girl who's also a candidate in this uh, Olympics. And then they, of course, they're teenagers, you know. So they start having this slightly, you know. So I read the script, which I quite like, and I told my friend, the English producer, I said it won't pass. He said, why? I said they're high school kids. It won't pass the education department. He's a high school kids. You know, all their hormones are, you know, 
You're not supposed to fall in, you know, <laughs> no bad scene, just, you know, this inkling. I said, no way. <laughs> if you make them university students, that will work. But the whole script is about this younger, you know. So, you know, so that's the kind of thing you say. You can't fit it, you know, and take the box for the sake of it. Because if it becomes high school student, uh, university student, it loses that kind of naivete, you know. But this I is actually, the kind of thing I, you have to learn. I saw that movie. It's, it's really good. Um, but it but it didn't qualify. <laughs> yeah, they, they, then they decided to make it without the the qualify because it doesn't work otherwise. You can't force a round peg into a square hole. You shouldn't do it anyway. You know. I will add, and I hate to to say this to nonsense, but all the bad stuff happens in Hong Kong. You can have corrupt co cops in Hong Kong, uh, especially pre ninety seven. <laughs> pre ninety seven, you have all the worst things in the world happen in Hong Kong. Post ninety seven, some qualifications. <laughs> I think maybe the water changed or something, right? <laughs> and no any water allowed in, in mainland China. Yeah. But it's uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, it's okay. Yeah, right. yeah. That just makes the stories, you know, into a, a in, 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 into a drama, you know, style. <laughs> we're, we're talking about the movie movie censorship, but my company is doing TV business in China also. We're producing more than 100 hour TV program every year in China. So the censorship for TV business is much more severe and uh, much more um, important for my industry than, than for the movie industry. Because the TV is considered to be entering into homes, you know, without yeah. barriers. Mm -hmm. The cinema, you can still have barriers. So if, if we apply our TV censorship uh, rules to the movie, I think it's, it's past 100% for the crew production. So it's, it's quite interesting that uh, in China there is uh, really uh, just a few professional film uh, making companies. They're usually the joint uh, uh, pr production companies for films and uh, television, even uh, in television programs. So it, it's it's also a a quite good way for for Chinese audience to, to you know. Firstly, they, they watch a quite popular TV series, and then go to the theatrical, to uh, theatrical film, and that is has been a strong trend in, in China, and many popular uh, novels to be um, produced as a TV series, and then the next following year it's got, uh, gonna be a a, um, uh, a big box office maker, yeah, in, in theaters. And uh, I think I think this is also why um, uh, uh, whereas Papa they they could make make a big uh, box office following a like a half year advertising and marketing to Chinese families. Yeah, and it just it's a two way thing now too. There's some movies, big movies come out, and then they do the TV series afterwards. But the, obviously, you know, the TV, like, actually, after the Papa one, there was another one called Running Man, equally silly, but anyway, did a huge box office again. Um, when you've just done um, a big tie-in with, um, with Hunan TV, which is right at the heartland of, of China, in Changsha. And, um, and they produced Where is, pa Where is Papa, which is a genius film, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear Feng Shaogang is doing the remake. Yeah. Um, but um, can you tell me a little bit about your experience of of that um, forming that partnership, which is going to be making numerous co-productions over coming years? Right? Yeah. So we, um, I, our entry into China is through distributing our movies, and we worked with many different partners, and uh, TIK Films and Hunan was one of the partners on uh, on distributing some of our films. And then we just, it was an organic thing to talk about to them about having a, a bigger partnership. And they came in and we did a very large slate financing deal. So they're financing 25% of the entire Lionsgate films for the next three years. So it's, it's one, I think it is the largest uh, media deal between China and a Western company so far um, because we make a lot of films. It's a lot of money. Um, and then they will distribute a, a small, a, a number of those films in China, but, um, and have equity in all of them all around the world. Now, and a, as a part of that deal, we also are looking at doing co-productions with them, and also uh, um, we have an opportunity to invest in their Chinese movies that they're producing. 
And in one of their first projects is actually a Chinese movie that they're going to shoot in the United States. And so their whole team last month came to meet with all of our production executives and find out how incredibly different it is going to be for them to shoot a movie in the US because they're learning about the guilds, they're learning about um, tax credits, like how like we're telling them, don't shoot. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't say this. <laughs> I'm going to censor myself. Um, <laughs> but you know, shoot in one state over another because you can actually get a, a, tax, a refund. It can be cheaper. Um, so uh, you know they're they're rewriting the script and they're they're learning a lot. They were thinking of bringing all of their crew over, and we said, oh no, you you can't do that because first of all you've got to get visas and um, you've got all of the 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 uh, unions in the United States would object to that because we have people who are qualified who can who can do the work. Um, so it's it's been a very positive experience so far. We're learning from them, they're learning from us, and, and hopefully we're gonna be making some good movies together. Um I'm just I'm gonna open the floor to questions in a minute, but just before before I do that, um I'll ask everyone on the panel to give if they had one piece of advice to give someone who was considering a co entering a co-production in China, what would what would be the the key thing? Well, I would say the same I would say to any producer who's making a movie anywhere, write a really good script. <laughs> uh, I think in China, find a good partner. Uh, <clears throat> have a clear idea of uh, what's your purpose to enter, to enter the Chinese market. To get financing from China or have your film distributed to, to, to get profit from the consuming market. I think that's that is two uh, key elements to do uh, co-production with China. Um, I would say be passionate and focusing on content itself because it's not that easy to find a good subject and good uh, script to co-produce with Chinese partners. It's not um, it's not about the money. It's more about content itself. My experience told me that um, I've been working with a major studio like Disney for many years in order to find the good project for co-production. Even with a company like Disney, it's not that easy to find a qualified project, a uh, good co concept. And uh, we're also testing some new methods starting from next uh, next month. We're going to announce also a deal with a major studio in Hollywood that we're probably going to make some remake of their uh, Hollywood Studios library to make their Chinese version remake. So probably this is a, another approach that we come up with a, um, uh, with uh, the road of the co-production, but anyway, um, I believe that the, the good, good, um, good way or good methods to starting a co-production with a Chinese uh, partner is uh, starting with a good script, good content. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, are there anyone, any questions out there? And if um, if you could identify yourself when before the question, we'd just like to know who we're talking to. Um, I don't know if there are microphones or um, if people just want to. Stand up. We'd see how loud you are. <laughs> um, maybe if we start with yourself here. Um, yeah, my name is Mark. I'm from Vietnam. Uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about the Chinese film market and where it is. Because it's not uh, not much criteria to to uh, Chinese film market. How would you say the type of collaboration is would you consider it to be in this sort of long Uh, okay. In ch in ch Did everyone hear the question, by the way? No. Okay. So we'll organize them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, well the question. Okay. Just, so <laughs> just briefly, um, I want to know a little bit more about the criteria for finding a good partner, because it's a little bit like going into a dark forest and not knowing where you're where you're headed. Thank you. So uh, I think you have to. Um, uh, I think Alan was saying just now that there are only a certain number of you know uh, established companies with enough of a, a reputation and a background to 
to, to be considered as, as, as good companies now. There may be others, but I'm just saying that, you know, and these companies I'm talking about, the longest one is 20 years old. Wow, ancient, you know. <laughs> so um, there are firstly the state companies, uh, China Film, Shanghai Film, which are the most active ones. Uh, Shanghai Film is, is the, uh, sorry, China Film is the most active one. Uh, I think unless you have, I'm being very candid here because I don't want to waste people's time. Uh, the China film, unless you have a very special relationship with somebody there, otherwise, because it is a state enterprise, then you'll just become one of many, and may, another film, may, another many other films may have priority over yours. So, of course, on paper, China film will look great because it's a state enterprise. You know, the approvability, as you were saying just now, and all kinds of things that will tell you that something's not going to work or whatever. But you may not be given as much attention. Uh, as you w would be somewhere else, maybe, because of the relationship thing. Um, then there are a bunch of private enterprise which has been around f for a while. There's a company called Huayi Media, and there's another company called Boner. These are the two longest ones. They each have certain characteristics. So depending on your project, that's why I said you know uh, earlier on you have to find the right partner. All of these companies would have money. They're plenty, they're very well funded. Uh, but their DNA is slightly different. So depending on your project, and uh, uh, you know, some one company is better with like specialty type of films, and another company may be better at the obvious big star type of films. Then there are a bunch of you know, also private enterprises who are serious players who've been around seven years, eight years, nine years, like LETV or uh, Nlight. Um, there's a bunch like that, Stellar Media. Um, yeah, it's not easy to, it's not difficult to check them to check out what there is available. And then after that, there'll be many, many, many more companies which have done a few films by now, some successful, some not as successful, many of them. And they may all have something. Like a company in Hangzhou, I know, uh, they're not very big. They've done the, the few films. Some one was quite successful. But they have a very strong writing uh, 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 team. So if your script needs a really strong writing team, and they all have money, you know, for sure. Um, if you have a very strong, you need some kind of strong writing is a big re prerequisite. I would suggest you partner with them. They're not the obvious big companies. They're not up there with the ones who've been around the longest. I mean, another big company is Wanda, and everybody looks on paper and Wanda is a huge real estate company. The owner is the richest man in China, or, or the second, depending on which chart you read, and he has 16 percent percent share of the cinema. Uh, cinemas in, in China, but not being derogatory to him, the films that they have uh, taken the initiative to drive, at least in the last few years, have not been hugely successful. Films they have partnered with people, where other people have driven the film, am I, am I correct, Clifford? I mean, they have, have done well. So is it because of bad luck? I don't know. But obviously on paper, they look great. I mean, you know, they have money, they have the cinemas, you know, they, they, you know, they have a lot of power. So that's what I mean. It's no, there's no straightforward answer, depending on a project, on your company, on yourself. You have to, I think, if you're serious, you should go and meet all of them. If it's a good project, you should meet all of them. And being a good producer, you will have form, start to form some sense of which would be a more suitable company for you. Uh, I want to add something yeah. on this question. I mean, we are, Limon Picture is uh, one of the company among all these many, many companies that uh, Madame Shi has mentioned. <laughs> That we are not China Film Group, we are not Wanda and uh, Bona or Huayi. We hadn't uh, a very strong track record. But I, what I want to say is that China has moving very, very fast. And the reason that Disney has picked up our, my company as the first partner in China is really becoming the, the person, the team that they're dealing with. They got a chance to meet all the China Film Group guys or Wanda guys. But uh, for making a core production, it's really something very hard for them to, to be... Uh, focusing 100% of their energy on because they have a bunch of other projects to do with. Most of them are purely Chinese and can make money in China. So I think it really depends on the person and the team that you you got the feeling, you got the chemistry to work with. So you got to spend a lot of time to talk with people in the market. And also, uh, Zhou Yuan was in uh, work for um, Shanghai Media Group with running their motion picture business. So you've seen both sides of big company and a small company, how do they uh, react to compare with uh, foreign partners? When I was working for the SMG, uh, the one of the largest media conglomerate in China, there's a bunch of foreign visitors coming visit us every day. So they, 
Disney, Warner Brothers, Sony, everybody comes us to want to work with us. But uh, in terms of big companies, they react uh, usually very long towards uh, foreigner, foreigner partners. And my suggestion would be that you may need to find someone to do due diligence for the potential partner in China. You know, um, my client, Kofi, the a Korean Film Council, whenever there's a, a, a Korean producer gonna have a deal with Chinese partners, they will have us to do due diligence about their background, about their experience, about about the um, uh, the guys' credit, um, who they are going to make deal with. I think it's, that is quite necessary. You know, there's really thousands of uh, media companies in China now. E everyone will say they are making movies and making uh, TV dramas. This is a fact. Oh, um, you start there. Hello, uh, I'm Anna Ewa I'm coming from Poland, from Film Commission Poland. And I'm interested if Chinese producers, Chinese companies are interested in going to shoot abroad. And if so, what is the deciding factor? Is it like incentives or more locations? Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese companies have been shooting abroad a lot, a lot, a lot in the past four or five years. I think last year, my friend in Italy, in Rome, says, oh, there are three Chinese crews here. They're just paying cash. They didn't even apply for the whatever. It's not incentives. It's too much trouble. It's too much like I mean because Hunan is different. They're working with Lionsgate, so they have this partner and they do all this. It's not incentives. It's too much paper filling forms. No need, you know. Uh, three years ago, two films shot in uh, vineyards in France, and they ended up buying the vineyard. Two uh, two were sold. Yeah, one is Galloping Horse. I can't remember the other one. Um, there's been shooting in in uh, in LA in well, Italy last year was the flavor of the month. One of the biggest directors we have, as um, um, Cliff was mentioning just now, is Feng Xiaogang. His last, but not the last, the one before the last film he shot at the ending, about 30 minutes in a place in Japan, northern Japan. Tourism went up 50 percent. Chinese tourists, so. Now when he goes anywhere, he's very commercial-minded. People will sponsor him. But he's not necessarily, because of that, he's going there. He just decided to go. You know? But now if, if he goes anywhere, he'll get a big sponsorship where everybody's, all the doors are open to him. So it's not incentive. Sometimes it's, it's, the, it's the story demands it, that demands it, needs it, because there's a film called uh, Finding Mr. Right. It's about all the men in China who have girlfriends or mistresses, and they send them to Seattle to have their babies. It's a true. It's real, you know. It's real, in real life. That's what's happening. So, and then they have these houses where they have the, all these pregnant women, and they have their babies, and then they go back with American passport. So, because of that, they shot in Seattle. But there are also other things where, because of the location, <coughs> everybody wants to think of more exotic, beautiful. You know, and for a while it was French vineyards, and then last year or recently, nine months, it's been Italy for some reason, and they're all over the place now. Yeah, my company actually is planning to shooting our next TV project in the States. One third of the production will be heard in the Los Angeles. I, I agree with uh, Madam Shu. The first intention is still the content itself. We want to show our audience that we we bring something different. Um, actually, as a TV company, we don't really aware of the tax rebate stuff. So it's not because we are not um, aware of money or budget. It's just that we don't have this kind of experience to work uh, internationally. But uh, uh, more and more, I think our company is going to adapt with those environments and uh, making more and more uh, rebate stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm a student at Syracuse University, and I'm just wondering, um, what, where do you draw the line between making a Chinese co-production film like globally marketable, and at the same time retaining a Chinese cultural identity within your film? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the challenge. <laughs> 
I think I think that's what where we what we started this with with the Great Wall. You know, is it? Uh, I think it, obviously it qualifies, so it, it's got the cultural identity. My, the, actually, the example that uh, I think it was someone at China Film Group used for, with me long ago was Kung Fu Panda, because the the panda is doing you know cutting paper and it's got that Chinese cultural element, and yet it's a film that appeals to everyone. So we're all sort of looking for the Kung Fu Panda of movies. You know what I said at the time to the film bureau? That we would never have passed the script for Kung Fu Panda. Because Kung Fu Panda was a very greedy, right? <laughs> greedy panda. If we, we, if we submitted a Chinese script, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite serious, you know? If we submitted a script with Panda, which is our national treasure, and this panda was so naughty and avarice and you know, wanted to eat all the time, yeah. we would not have passed. They would have said, this is insulting, right? Yeah. But I think Chinese, you know, culture is not, you know, you can't, there's no formula. You have the cultural spirit. If you have, you are, if you're telling a story which has the values of the Chinese heritage is there. You know, you can't say, oh, here's the Chinese heritage part. I mean, it's just there, you know. Yeah, well, it, ha the, it has to be organic to the story. That's the key. You can't just try to, like, plop it on. Like, I'm sure everyone is looking at their scripts right now and saying, oh, can we just stick in a little Chinese element? That's not going to work. It has to start from the very beginning so that it's a very organic and it, it fits within the story. Uh, my name is, hello, my name is Francois. I'm a film, uh, film producer in, in France. I was just going to ask you the same, let's just answer the question. Uh, I have two questions. Is uh, How would uh, Chinese part would consider developing a script together that will, you know, fit the elements uh, and the regulation from the country and still has uh, an international appeal. So once you get to the market, you can sell your film, you know, abroad. That's the first one. And the second one is uh, how uh, Chinese producer like to be approached. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, the so-called uh, uh, the restrictions, if you will, about censorship is not preventing films from being s well received every uh, uh, elsewhere in the world. I don't think that's a that's a. It is just technically they are like actually when you were saying every country has its certain rules and regulations, but in China there's there's a little bit more related to content that you have to be aware of. But I don't think that has stopped the world from watching good Chinese movies if there are, if there's such a thing. Um, well, we're, we're looking at developing a co-production from scratch, and we're looking at having a Western writer working with a Chinese writer because it's not going to work to have just a Western writer write what they imagine China to be. You'll never get the, the nuances or the, or the cultural elements, just as it really wouldn't work to do, um, a, well, a, a, a US-French co-production and sort of imagine what it's like to live in, in France or have those certain French things. You've got to have some some creative person on the production who understands the, the culture working on, de on the development. And whether it's having a, two writers working together from the two cultures, we'll, we'll see if it works. We're, we're experimenting right now. Actually, I'm working on it. I mean, from market to market, I'm start looking for the, at least a French or European producer who is interested in China and want to leverage on China market or China investors to, to make a uh, China-focused international market, which means that part of the project is going to be focusing on China, China, Chinese market, but it still has a global and international commercial appeal. It's not easy at that stage for me to evaluate correctly in each script, but I'm, me and my team is learning on it. I think f for the next market, probably we're going to find some real good uh, producer that we can work with for some action-oriented commercial movies. So I think a lot of these different types of experimentations are going on, what Wendy is saying, what uh, Mr. Zhou is saying. 
all kinds of, you know, some are saying, okay, we're going to write the entire thing in English first. At least we make sure the structure is there, the story is there, the characters are there. Then we'll get a Chinese writer and version it. That's one way of doing it. That's been going on a long time or so. There's another version now, which is a lot now, where they, a, 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 a writer, an, an English writing in English, uh, where some knowledge of China, I mean, not, not deep knowledge, but, you know, it can't have just come out of a cave, you know, so, and working with a Chinese writer together, that, that is going on too. I don't think there's a fixed model. I think it just depends on that person, that story, you know, whatever makes it work for you, just whatever way makes it work for you. I don't think it matters. When you say, how do producers want to be approached? Every producer in the world always just want a good script. You have a good script, everything else will, is not, I mean, it's not impossible, but it's, it's very few production obstacles nowadays with the resources that we can have. So it's the good script that will get you anywhere. But how does that actually work? I'm just in, in terms of how does one approach, uh, if one was interested in, in dealing, uh, in organizing a Chinese co-production, what would be the channels that one should go through? Well, uh, just now, as uh, Ms. Zhao was saying also, I mean, you have to do some homework. You have to go meet the people. You know, you actually, you know, I mean, you cold call, you send an email, or you come to a market, you're bound to meet the people if you're serious about what you want to do. You should meet the people first and get in the door and sit down and have a meeting. And then if you feel that you're confident enough, because even some, because of the, the way we're trained, I mean, if, if somebody just sent me an email with a script, I wouldn't read it because of the confidentiality reasons, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to at least know one another a bit, and then, then we, you know, you have, if you have a project, then if you have a ready script, which is good, then it's better. If you don't, you have to find a company who is willing to, to develop it with you. Um, but I think if you have a script that moves you much faster down the lane. And uh, my suggestion will be you may need to uh, make your proposals and your storylines into bilingual. The Chinese word is quite important. Uh, as far as I see, most of the Chinese boss, they, they don't understand, uh, can read English directly. And if you simply provide English word, it's certainly hard to, to, to get the, 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 final, uh, the final step. Another suggestion is probably go through, still go through some major international studios first. Because for the Chinese company as the individual independent um, content company, they are not really um, confident to at that stage to deal directly with an uh, independent producer. I think through the company like Linescape or other major um, independent distribution company can increase a lot of the, the ratio of success to work with China. Okay. Um. Yep, this lady over here. If you just wait for the microphone, just one second. Is there? Yep. Yeah, it's coming out. Just one sec. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Liang Li from the. I'm a Chinese French producer, so I'm a kind of doing co-production the rural guy, rural people. So uh, I did the co-production project 15 years before, you know, for the uh, French Chinese project like uh, Bazak and the small tailor, Chinese tailor. And so um, I go through all the processes, you know, and 15 years before. Uh, so today it's changed from the economy, you know, uh, in China. Uh, but I'm still doing processing, you know, in negotiation with, uh, you know, major player co-production with the French. Uh, co-production company. Uh, my uh, concern is about there is a two major issues I found in the you know in working with uh, co-production. The first thing is about you know the understanding of the different uh, you know production uh, creative mentality is quite different. So content is king for this kind of business, but the understanding the content international level and the understanding content, Chinese level is quite different. And I am in past a lot of time try to convince, you know, Chinese producer to understand, you know, like uh, international production or French production kind of creative idea, you know. So so this is uh, um, a kind of big gap. 
So I'm wondering if you have some uh, kind of practice, uh, you know, suggestion from this creative side. And the other issue that will be for foreign producer, uh, it's quite difficult to get part of the distribution, you know, for the foreign producer. And uh, from our case is like uh, all the distribution in China is take charge by the Chinese producer. We cannot share the market for the foreign producer. So I'm wondering if the, you know, uh, for the land landscape, the international distribution, how you get the part of the distribution in China market for foreign producer, <laughs> you know, or distributor? Well, in terms of getting our movies distributed in China, that, that's a different thing because we're making bigger movies that we're able to get a quota slot or a rev share slot. But I, I'm not completely sure I understood the question. But in terms of if we were to have like a, a co-production movie that was in China and getting it distributed in the rest of the world, we're really looking at making commercial movies that will have a chance. Chinese movies are, are more challenging. Um, and there are, uh, we've been approached with very big budget Chinese movies saying, you know, will you distribute this in the United States or, or the rest of the world? And there just isn't the market for them yet. It, they're, it's, a, it's a different aesthetic. It's a different uh, kind of thing. And um, so we're, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to f find that, that mixture that's going to work for both China and the rest of the world. I, I'm not exactly sure if I answered that. Oh, we, we have no problem. We've actually found the Chinese distribution partners to be very, um, very good in terms of giving us, you know, we, we do a contract and they pay us a minimum guarantee and we've gotten overages. If the movies do well, we, we actually have, have had very good experiences in China in terms of getting the money. Um, but it's all about how you do the deal up, up front. I, I believe that your question is, um, my understanding of this, your question is really um, case by case basis because the lines case is produced global level and commercial big movies. So they must find a reliable Chinese distributor to be work with and uh, collect Chinese money and redistribute, re um, allocate the money from to the lines case. Yeah. But for the projects you had mentioned, like the Bodhidaya Sessionwas, surround this kind of project is pretty much the I House movie that most of Chinese producers are less confident to their Chinese box office performance. So probably they, they feel less confident to work with foreign producers by saying that I want to keep China by, by our own. So you work in your, your foreign side, I work in my China side. This is pretty much the situation when when you work with in the very independent market that an independent producer work with independent producers. If your project is qualified by Lionsgate's uh, stand-up points and uh, their standards, and if you can also uh, find a Chinese good um, domestic distributors, of course the, the whole economy is different. I think we've probably time for one more question. If people could keep the questions Reasonably concise, please. That'd be My name is. Oh, sorry. My name is Karen. Oh, sorry. Am I up? Or? Okay. Well, if um, we'll take two more questions then. So the person I can't see. So the person is just about to. Uh, okay, there. So a uh, question here, and then and then you, sir. Yeah. Okay. My name is Karen. I'm here with a bunch of students from Canada and the United States. Madam Shi, thank you so much for your stories about censorship. Our question is about ghosts. Can we get some clarification? First off, is referencing ancestral worship considered under a no-no? And also, how does this no-no uh, for ghosts, how does that impact the horror genre? So uh, ancestral uh, worship is no problem. Ghost means uh, uh, there are no horror movies. There are thrillers, there are suspense movies. There's no such thing as horror as you and I know it. You know, you can't open a door and this, this thing appears, you know, the ghost ghosts, you know. There, there are very few. It's only actually in the last maybe eight or seven or eight years that people have tried, attempted to 
kind of mm, push the edge a bit. So now that that some of these uh, that you could be fantasy, fantasy is okay. I don't know whether you do watch Chinese films, but there's a series called Painted Skin. So that would work because it's not a ghost; it's like a elfin or a whatever. That you know, that all that category works, but no real ghosts, you know, as in as you and I know it. Okay. No Walking Dead. Yeah. <laughs> no zombies. Uh, Except no. on TV. TV, they have zombies. Well, Walking Dead is on TV. No, no, not at all. No, not on TV. Probably is on the online video platform. Online video platform. But uh, yeah. definitely not on so TV. Online video. I'll, te I'll tell you another funny story, though. I did. <laughs> I thought I knew a little bit about sensory in China, and then we made a film called Black Mask, uh, which actually launched Jet Li into the international market. So we're going to make the second Black Mask, and if you've seen it, it's about uh, mutants. So and then and then the director said, "Oh, Shanghai is very futuristic looking. The buildings are very futuristic looking. Let's shoot in in Shanghai." So I applied. Uh, it's a futuristic film, right? So I applied, and then the reply was, the notes, the the content script uh, notes was, there are no mutants in China. <laughs> I think, and then we just have a final question from you over there, sir. Yeah, similar. A similar question on a related subject. Uh, I'm D.W. Gordon, Grand Slam Pictures. I'm making a movie about the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915, and there's two uh, views of, of that history. There's what I would call the conventional view, which is evil German sub sinks a uh, British uh, ship, the Lusitania, and there's the revisionist view of history, which implicates Churchill, quite controversial, uh, quite a little bit conspiratorial around that. Will I have any problems, because we're all salivating over the box office numbers in China, especially after seeing what Titanic did. Will I have any problems with the Censorship Bureau getting that movie distributed in China because it sort of advocates revisionist history? Uh, on the face of it, no. But you know, scripts and uh, how you shoot a film can have very different uh, shades of meanings depending on how you do it, you know? I mean, the greatest propaganda films were shot by Wiesenstahl for Hitler. And I mean, if you just look at the script, I'm sure it didn't look like what it did in the end, right? <laughs> so on the face of it, in the story, or if you say revisionist view, it doesn't sound like it's problematic, but it but really depends on how you do it. Alan, is that one of the 10 out of 11 that uh, might cause a problem? Is that one of the categories that they look at specifically? Or anybody, I guess? Well, this. This wouldn't be a co-production. No. This would no. just, you're just trying to get a foreign movie imported. And I don't think it would be a problem because it doesn't deal with Chinese history. It's, it's what purely Western history. And I, f I don't think it would be a problem, actually. Yeah. And a colonial overlord to boot. So. Yeah. Right, good point. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. I wanted to say thank you very much to our panel today. I think it's been a very exciting... Um, um, I really enjoyed it. I hope you all did. So, um, yeah, well, no, that, thank you very much, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you. And I want to thank effectively Cl Clifford uh, for his help and uh, for this uh, great round table, and of course, our professional speakers. Very interesting. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. So, of course, the marché and the festival continues, so you can enjoy and work very, well. we are very happy to welcome you for this uh, Chinese summit. It was the last conference. Thank you. <laughs>